Two of my favourite YouTubers recently uploaded videos comprising a friendly dispute over what's going on with the mould effect, also known as the chain fountain. Now, in case you just arrived on this planet and you don't know what that is, it's this. I've got a beaker full of ball link chain here, and when I do this, a loop of chain rises up out of the beaker, which looks really weird. It's called The Mould Effect, and it's named after Steve Mould, who's one of the YouTubers that I mentioned just now. In case you weren't aware of Steve, or indeed Medi from Electroboom, the other party in the debate, please do check out their channels. They're really awesome. Anyway, there's been a heck of a lot of reasoned debate, hypotheses, argument, and also angry shouting about what's happening. Why does it do this? How does it work? What's going on? Well, disclaimers first. I have no meaningful science credentials, and some, actually probably most, of what follows here is armchair physics and might well be completely wrong. It's rather likely that I will use the wrong terminology, like saying inertia when I should say momentum, or energy when I mean work, or speed when I mean velocity. I ask you to kindly overlook such things. I'm not saying don't correct me if I use the wrong terminology. That's fine, I would like to know. Just let's not allow nitpicks to get in the way of interesting questions and observations. Anyway, part of the reason I think that the discussion on this topic has run as long and broad as this is that when people ask, why does it do that? They're not actually all asking the same question. So I want to break this down into four, well, really three and a half separate pieces. Question one is, why does the loop rise above the beaker? And then kind of 1A is, why is the height of the loop greater when the beaker is further above the ground? Question 2, how does a downward motion or force outside the beaker translate to an upward motion or force inside? And thirdly, I think this is the one everybody's really hung up on, is why does this happen with this particular type of chain material, but not, or not nearly so much, with other types of chain? The answer to question 1, why does the loop rise above the beaker, is both simple and kind of unsatisfying. The work done by the chain falling outside of the beaker is greater than the work required to lift the chain out of the beaker, because the chain outside of the beaker is falling to a lower level than the chain inside. This is the same phenomenon as a liquid siphon. The chain falling over here creates enough force to lift the chain here up this high before it falls over. Don't worry, this is not the interesting part. And then 1A is related. The longer and further the chain falls outside of the beaker, the more work it does, and that translates to lifting the chain higher above the beaker before it falls. There's just kind of more energy in the system. Now, I actually got really excited when I thought about this bit, and I hurriedly threw together a diagram comparing the work done by a set of links falling compared to the work required to lift an equal number of links up off the pile and out of the beaker. I thought I had the answer. And it is an answer, or part of the answer, but it's not all of the answer. And I thought this could be proven to be the singular factor by running the chain over a freely rotating pulley and comparing the behaviour when it's coming out of a beaker held below versus when it's just vertically hanging chains on both sides, one shorter than the other. I thought we would find that the chain jumps off the pulley in the first instance, but not the second. I'm not nearly so sure about that now, but let's run the experiment anyway. Fortunately, I have a very tall house. When I bought this house, they said it would help to have a tall house if I ever wanted to own a giraffe. Turned out that didn't help at all, but at least I have a high window that I can drop chains from. So when I do it out of this high window, we get a taller loop of chain out of the beaker because we've got a further drop for this chain to go outside the beaker. So there's more work being done by this great long length of chain that falls than is needed to lift the chain out of the beaker there. However, what I want to do now is dispense with the beaker entirely and run the experiment over a spool like this. It's going to be tricky because I think that without the beaker and just a shorter vertical length of chain on that side, we will still get enough movement happening that the chain jumps off of here. And I think we could get a really, really tall chain fountain, but I'm not sure. It doesn't help that it's really windy outside. That's going to confound my experiment, I think. But we'll have a go. So I guess the first thing I need to do is just let some of this chain down, which it's more than happy to do on its own. And I'll keep on doing that till I hit the ground. Right, apologies if there's wind noise on here. You're just going to have to take my word for it that this has got the longer length of chain on it that goes all the way down to the ground. This has got a shorter length of chain on it, so I want to see what happens when I allow... Damn it, it's tangled up with itself. 
Okay, I'm gonna have to do it this way so I can put my finger inside the loop. I don't know that we're gonna get any effect until it's too late, but it's sort of working. Yeah, no. Studio Shrimp here, and just when I was editing that video, I thought that experiment was a failure, but actually let's just go back and look at those last few frames of where that chain was going over the spool. And we can see that as that shortest length of chain comes up, it overshoots the spool and lifts right off the spool. I think if we were able to get this chain up to speed, we would see the mold effect on the top loop of the chain here, and we could whisk that spool away, and we would have like a 10 meter tall loop of self-supporting chain, just by virtue of the fact that the work done by the falling side is greater than the work required to lift the rising side. But don't worry, this also isn't the interesting bit. Here are the two interesting bits of the question. Question two, how does a downward force here translate to an upward force here? This bit is very hotly debated, but I actually think it's very simple. Each ball link of the chain can only communicate forces with the ball links directly adjacent to it. So this ball here is imparting forces only to those two here and here. And if we simplify that down to two links linked by an inelastic cord, when one of them moves in a direction that isn't in line with the link between them, there's a sort of slingshot effect. For example, if the two bodies are arranged like this, and one of them moves in this direction horizontally, which looks like it should only apply a horizontal force, the position of the other body actually means the inelastic link will translate that into a force that has an upward vector component. I just did a quick simulation of this in a physics sandbox program called Algodoo. Link in the description. I also had a go with setting up a simulation of a short length of ball chain, but I don't know this software well enough yet to do that properly. But again, we can see that horizontal movement of this part of the chain translates into a vertical movement over here. But let's just back up to the simpler version and simplify it even further. When this ball moves this way, this ball wants to move that way. What happens when we apply this to every link in the chain? So we could imagine a pair of links here at the very top of the loop. This one wants to move sideways, but in doing so, it's pulling the next one up a bit. And if we kind of iterate this all the way round the links in the chain, we get this. Balls over here are pulling downwards, and that downward force is gradually being translated into an upward force by virtue of all of those individual transfers all the way along the chain. Furthermore, conservation of momentum means that ball links that already have an upward motion want to keep that upward motion. So once a ball is kind of heaved up out of the pile, it wants to keep going up. It can't just do that, of course, because it's tethered to the other balls in the chain and because, of course, gravity. But another way to look at this is to stop thinking of all the individual pieces and look at it as a phenomenon. For example, waves breaking on the seashore are absolutely doing what they do because of the behaviours of individual molecules of water but it's perhaps more useful to zoom out and look at the wave as a phenomenon in its own right. You don't even really need to know that water is made of molecules to be able to describe the behaviour of waves on water. And there's a reason I chose to talk about waves right here, because I feel pretty sure that what we're looking at here when we observe the mould effect is a kind of wave. It's travelling the length of the chain, just like it would be if I laid the chain out flat on the floor or table and flicked one end like this. Now, waves on the surface of water are not exactly the same as ripples in a chain or vibrations in a string, but they do share a set of properties, so it can be a useful analogy as long as we don't get too carried away. Now, some of you looking at this might be saying, oh, but when you did that, you imparted an upward motion to the end of the chain. That's cheating, right? All that's happening here is the initial upward motion is being transferred along the chain, right? Well, yes, but also no. If we think of the thing in terms of potential energy, the balls here are going up to a higher potential energy state because the balls here are going down to a lower state. Don't believe me? OK, let's run that experiment again, but this time I will only impart a downward force on my end of the chain. To prevent me cheating, I've taped the end of the chain to this ball thrower device, which I will dry fire directly downward. See, we still get a wave because things here are expending their potential energy and transferring it as kinetic energy to the next link along. Now it's not such a big wave because an up and down flick of the chain simply imparts more energy into the system than a single downward flick, but the principle is the same. So let's run that experiment again, but this time I'm going to create a ramp, a sort of beach for the wave to run up. My prediction is that the wave will shorten in length and increase in amplitude. It might not be very easy to see, and I will use the up and down flick just so we can get more energy into the system, but let's have a go anyway. So like a wave breaking on a beach, an upward gradient, that is a transition from deep to shallow, causes the wave to peak higher. Now imagine for a moment we could create some sort of magic treadmill setup where we presented the wave with a continuous transition from deep to shallow. Not sure it's even possible with beaches and water, but try to imagine it. 
I'm fairly sure that what would happen is we'd get some sort of standing wave effect. The continuous transition from deep to shallow would, ignoring things like turbulent flow, result in a tall wave sort of stuck in place. And I think that's very closely analogous to what we're seeing with the mould effect. The beaker is shallow, the chain going over the side is deep, there's a wave propagating along the chain at the same time as the chain is falling away, creating a sort of treadmill that keeps the wave in place. The greater the difference between the deep and shallow sides, the taller the wave. OK, and the question everybody's really struggling with, why does this happen with ball chain and not with other materials, or not nearly so much? Well, I think the reason for this is, put simply, the ball chain is kind of like a fluid. It flows. It's highly flexible and smooth, at least at a scale above the bumpiness of the individual ball links. Forces and motion can be transferred from one portion of the chain to another smoothly, without much loss to friction, without jerky transitions. One link of the chain is pretty much constrained to follow the next one in a way that I would like to suggest resembles laminar flow in actual fluids. Let's just take a closer look at the ball chain and compare it to a regular link chain. Firstly, the links of the ball chain are radially symmetric along the axis of the chain. This not only reduces the likelihood of anything snagging or catching as the chain uncoils out of the container, but it also means that when one link exerts a force on the next link, that force is pretty much guaranteed to act on the centre of mass of the next ball. And if you look really closely at the way the chain is actually constructed, to any extent that misalignment of an individual ball causes the force to act off-centre, it does so in a way that tends to correct the misalignment. And this makes this kind of chain inherently stable in its behaviour. So when we look at, let's say, three adjacent links of chain, there just aren't a lot of different ways for them to be configured. There's not tremendous scope for the centre of mass of the links to deviate from the axis of the chain. Now compare that with three adjacent links of regular chain, and look at how they can be configured in many different ways, and look at how different those ways are actually from each other. The links of this regular chain are very free to wiggle and rotate and oscillate in different ways. Each of those configurations is able to shift the centre of mass of parts of the chain, and those deviations can serve to reinforce themselves. Also, when the configuration of these links change from moment to moment, that requires an input of energy. So instead of just lifting the chain neatly out of the cup, energy is kind of spent, flapping it all about. And this means less of it is getting applied to the job of lifting the links. The ball chain simply doesn't have the capacity for the links to flap around into different energy-hungry orientations and configurations. And so it's all transferred much more efficiently to the job of lifting the chain up. Or to extend the analogy, if the ball chain moves a bit like laminar flow of a liquid, the link chain moves a bit like turbulent flow. Now I hope to demonstrate this with the help of the Wobble Dog machine. Hopefully what we'll see here is that the movement of the ball chain is very well behaved and regular, whereas the movement of the link chain is a bit kind of chaotic and turbulent. The ball chain is also quite dense, which means any effects relating to conservation of momentum have a chance to be seen above the noise of other effects and above the damping of friction, air resistance and other external factors. I'm not very sure that air resistance is a major factor in this, but it could be part of the picture, because the ball links in the ball chain are all riding in each other's wakes. The links in the link chain are not, because they're oriented at 90 degrees to one another, from one link to the next. Now, I probably should have said earlier, I'm not even sure I did or said an original thing at all in this video. There's so much debate, argument, discussion, crossed wires and everything around this topic, and I've kind of lost track of who's arguing what, and whether anyone, including Steve himself, has said some or all of what I've said in this video. But anyway, there it is. I hope this was interesting. Please do check out Steve's and Medi's channels. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.